It's on its own. It's stereo. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm very grateful for you making the time to be here today to see a presentation, a very important presentation for the deaf and hard of hearing mental health services and the designs and proposals that we have in place. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice summary of all the work that we've done in the past period of time. But before I do start, the inevitable housekeeping, the bathrooms are out this way around the back of the, um, the wall behind me. Any, uh, in case of an emergency, the nearest lifts are the ones that you would have come up from near the reception desk. And also for your information, there is a TV over there with uh, live remote captions that are being displayed. The text uh, is not huge, but um, hopefully where you're sitting, you can see them. Um, but if not, maybe you can relocate to get a better view of those. So first of all, I'll start. My name is Philip Waters. It's great to be here. I'm the general manager of Deaf Victoria. It's nice to see so many faces and add them to a name. There's a few new people here I've met also. I'd like to make an acknowledgement to, uh, to country. Deaf Victoria acknowledges the Aboriginal and Torres Strait, Strait Islander people as the first people of Australia. And we pay respects to their elders past and present and future. And the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and um, our, our, our appreciation, respect and acknowledgement goes to those people on whose land that we are gathering on today. I'd also like to take the opportunity to make an acknowledgement of deaf and hard of hearing people with a lived or living experience of mental health whether it's uh, relating to um, people who have lived experience on trauma or neurodiversity, mental ill health and substance use or addiction, and their families and carers and supporters. We would also like to extend the recognition to clinical and non-clinical workforces that support people with lived experiences also. Additionally, I'd also like to make an acknowledgement to this list of deaf and hard of hearing leaders who have paved the way in the mental health space for deaf and hard of hearing people for a number of years. And I think these people who are listed on this slide here have really made a significant difference. They are allies in the space of deaf and hard of hearing and they've um, advocated tirelessly that has essentially led us to be where we are here today. And they've really taken some great steps and hopefully we can um, pay tribute to the work that they've done. I'd also like to pay a respect to some deaf and hard of hearing people who are no longer with us, but they um, deserve to be recognised um, and who did experience mental health in their lives. And I'd like to just acknowledge the, the names and uh, initials of the people that I've put up here on the screen for you to see. Okay, so that's enough of the introductions. How about we get stuck into business? I'd like to pay us... Um, I'd, I'd pay specific um, thanks to you all, and I'd like to introduce Amy O'Shea, Dr. Amy O'Shea, who's from the Deakin University, who's coming up to make a brief introduction. Amy. So I'd like to start um, signing today. I think it's important to connect in with the audience that I'm presenting to, and then I'll change over to speak in English. Poor interpreters, they're going to have to be agile in this space. Thank you very much, Philip, for that lovely introduction and for asking me to be here and present today. I'd like to also acknowledge the land on which we're meeting today and acknowledge all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people who may be joining us. It's really important for me to add as well, I'd like to acknowledge our deaf community members. For 25 years, I've been involved in this community. 25 years. Oh, sorry, excuse me. Ah, oh, not enough signing, obviously. I'm still getting all mixed up in my glasses. Apologies. 25 years within the deaf community, sharing people's experiences, their culture. And that's just been wonderful that they've handed that and bestowed that information to me. Again and again, the deaf community have given me the opportunity to learn from them. 
I've taken on their wisdom and their experiences and I'm incredibly privileged to be in that position. Now I'm going to swap over to English. It was important to me to find a way to make that relationship reciprocal. And for a while I did that as an interpreter. Um, I moved in into academia and a different specialty, which is around intellectual disability and sexuality. But more recently, there have been these amazing opportunities to reconnect with working and bridging my own work in research and, and the signing deaf community. And that didn't come from nowhere. It came from a deep interconnectedness and trust that had been given and placed in me by people over time by people who knew people, who asked people, who'd known me for decades if I was any good. And I think thankfully those people said, yes, I hope that I've honoured that. I just spoke to Neil here about a, a friend we have in common from 25 years ago, um, which makes me feel like we're friends already. Um, when Philip invited me to partner on this grant uh, and to conduct the research element to ensure that we really were grabbing and reflecting best practice internationally. Um, I said yes, and it, uh, the funds and the action arrived very quickly. Um, Philip was a little bit like a, a naval captain guiding us through um, waters with action and at speed because nine months later here we are having produced something. Um, I, f I admire so much about Philip, his commitment, his leadership and his advocacy which comes from a depth of thinking about how to create change. So again, here was an opportunity to give back, to experience a reciprocal nature to my relationship with the deaf community using my skills and my knowledge, and hopefully be part of something which allows us to develop meaningful change. It wasn't just me, I worked with my colleague Isha Bali, now, Isha can't be here because right now she's in Burwood delivering a week 11 lecture on human rights. Let's hope the students are still turning up, even though it's week 11. Um, not having any connection with um, deafness or signing health outcomes, Isha landed in this work because her own experience and professional expertise is around um, and as a member of the Australian Indian community and understanding mental health stigma and experiences for that community. And what she did excellently was pick up a cultural linguistic lens and apply it to her work here. The last comment I'd make, and this is on behalf of Deacon, is that I feel enabled to do this work by the commitment that Deacon has to addressing health inequities, to transforming healthcare and to trying to do better for everyone. So this project aligns with that. It was informed by it. It sits alongside our organisational values of excellence, inclusion and dynamism. Deacon worked with Deaf Victoria on the first Deafness and Mental Health Conference in 2015. I was there, I think I was pregnant with the young, of, younger of my two over there, but I was there um, and since then hosted a fantastic event earlier this year led by our PhD student, Ramis McRae. So at Deakin, we are particularly proud to be part of this work and to continue to be part of a brave search for change. To end, I'd like to, I'd like to ask you all to think about how you two can make the learning that you get today, the learning that you've had from deaf people in the deaf community over time and you will continue to have, how you can make that also reciprocal so that we can together improve health and well-being for the deaf community. Thanks, Amy. Much appreciated. I really, um, those were lovely words. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce um, Ramus, Ramus McRae, who Amy uh, referred to in her commentary. Uh, Ramus is a 
PhD student at Deakin University. He's still working through his PhD and he'll introduce some of his findings um, to you all this oh. morning. Sorry, Sorry Ramas, just bear with me. There's something else I just, I've jumped at that. I got to be too excited. There's mm -hmm. one other thing I wanted to make mention of. The the government or the minister person who we invited uh, to come here today was unavailable, but they have provided a video message to all of us and I have it here <clears throat> for you. Thank you and good morning. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people, the traditional owners of this land. I pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to any elders or First Nations people present today. Thank you, Deaf Victoria, for inviting me to join you for your presentation of the deaf and hard of hearing mental health service model. I apologise for not being there. The Royal Commission into Victoria's mental health system recognised the strength and knowledge of community leaders and community-led organisations in understanding the mental health needs of their communities. We know that deaf and hard of hearing people face significant barriers when accessing the mental health system. Barriers such as the lack of training of mental health professionals related to deaf and hard of hearing awareness, shortage of mental health professionals who understand deaf traumas and can communicate effectively in Auslan or have experience working with interpreters. In the 23 to 25 period, the Victorian government is investing a total of $4.2 million on projects through our Diverse Communities Mental Health and Wellbeing Grants Program. The grants program will deliver a range of services, programs and research to create a more inclusive and culturally safe mental health system. This includes over $230,000 awarded to Deaf Victoria to design a model of care within Victoria's mental health system that will be accessible for deaf and hard of hearing people and to deliver deaf cultural competency training for mental health workers. It's our hope that through this important work, we reduce and remove the barriers deaf and hard of hearing Victorians face when accessing mental health care. Congratulations to Deaf Victoria for your work in designing a deaf and hard of hearing mental health service model. And thank you for your active leadership and commitment in shaping the mental health reforms in Victoria. My department and I look forward to hearing more about your work on this model. Thank you to Ingrid Sitt, Minister for Mental Health. Okay, um, back to Ramos. Thanks, Ramos. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Ramos. I'm a PhD student, like Amy mentioned earlier. Uh, a PhD student at Deakin University. I'm and Amy is also my supervisor at Deakin University too. So there's um, uh, some synergy there. Uh, thank you also to Deaf Victoria for inviting me to speak here. I understand it's significant. I'd also like to pay respect to the, um, I've done a lot of research rather in this space. So I have a lot of pleasure in delivering some of the findings. Uh, you know, hopefully um, you, you I, I hope to only be five minutes. I don't want to see anybody sort of timing me. I'll do my very best to keep to that period of time. It's also a nice opportunity for me to share some of the findings. Um, there's two cohorts, I suppose, that I've been doing my research with. I've interviewed a number of deaf and hard of hearing people, 16 people all together, and they've shared their experiences growing up with mental health over their life, uh, how they've communicated with their family, uh, all the experiences that they've shared throughout that experience. And the other cohort is that I've been studying is through a survey or a questionnaire that um, a quality and quantitative survey rather to, to to ask people around Australia, deaf and hard of hearing people over 18 about their experiences at home, the workplace and the mental health experiences those people have had through those uh, periods. Now, before I do start though, I'd like to just summarise that um, Deaf Australia have actually done some research themselves independent from me. Uh, now, Deaf Australia recently did provides some information to the commission regarding a census that they conducted in 2023. And we had 850 deaf and hard of hearing people who responded to that census and they were able to then gather quite a lot of information. And a lot of the information that we considered, there was around 50% of that group where they had a medical diagnosis through uh, formal medical um, structures. 
and then they were able to then access services based on those medical diagnoses. So that's 50% and the other 50% are people who had no medical diagnosis. So there was an interesting discovery and that's half of the, the people. The other 50% who had no medical diagnosis are the people who I felt were the people that were either self-diagnosing or they felt that they had some issue and that they then uh, revealed that to people who they knew and trusted and then hoped that they may have been able to navigate the system or navigate what was available to them. But for people who are deaf and hard of hearing, communication and culture is uh, intrinsic to their way of navigating the system and they were uh, encountered a lot of barriers along the way. That's a lot of numbers. I mean, 50 50 is significant. So you may or may not know, but I might take the opportunity to just reveal this information again in this formal setting while we're all together. You obviously know people who are like you that hearing people, I refer to those people who aren't deaf, so that you're hearing and that you're able to then live in a world that is essentially a hearing environment. And I guess congratulations to you as hearing people that you don't really experience as those barriers that deaf people do. But of course, people who are deaf and have a, sorry, people who are hearing and have a deaf child, um, that percentage of that is quite low. And that's a, it's a consideration. I mean, just curious how many people who you think are born to hearing parents are deaf? Can I get a show of hands what you might think? What sort of percentage do you think Okay, so 98% from you. 80%. Yeah, any idea what percentage of people are born deaf to hearing parents? So we're getting a quite, I'm going to go on the other side of the room. We're getting some, what did you, 1%? Yeah. Okay. 80%, five. Okay. All right, good. It's a good exercise. So here's the number. So 95 to 97% in Australia of hearing parents uh, have deaf children. So the deaf children that are born, 97% of those deaf children have hearing parents. Okay. So the next question I ask of this 97% of hearing parents with deaf children, what percentage of them learn sign language and communicate with their deaf children? Children. What percentage? Hang on. No, 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 not you. You can hold on. You, 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 I think you know the numbers. Just bear with me. About 10%, yeah. Zero, five. Yeah, any idea? 100. Okay. All right. Let me, let me reveal that number to you. Are you ready? Drum roll. Okay. So this means that uh, of all the deaf children that are born, 97% have hearing parents. 8% of that group of hearing parents learn sign language to communicate. And Tegan got that right. So congratulations. So there's um, there's obviously a lot of these deaf children are born to hearing parents, 97%. That's a very large number of hearing parents of deaf children. Okay, so that's the fun quiz bit out of the way. Now I'll talk about some of the uh, the research and the findings. <clears throat> the interviews and uh, that I conducted with deaf and hard of hearing people, I found a couple of themes, I suppose I would say, uh, from the responses that I uh, received. So here on the left here, I have the intrinsic stresses, the internal and then extrinsic exclusionary treatment or stresses. Intrinsic stresses essentially means me as a deaf person growing up and I feel that it's, I'm navigating and trying to find my way. Remember I was saying somewhere around the 80% number of parents, the 8% rather. So it's it, it's trying to navigate as a deaf person in a hearing world, finding um, so many barriers along the way. And also the identity confusion that exists. Am I a deaf person or am I sort of like a hearing person? Do, do I fit into the hearing world or am I... Where, where do I belong? There's that consideration. The cross-cultural and code switching that takes place. So as a deaf person or a hearing person, you have, and we have different cultures. A hearing culture might be quiet and we should we be quiet and be respectful and we don't speak up and we're eating dinner. Whereas in the deaf, deaf dinner table, it would be loud and have no consideration for the noise that we're making while we might be eating, for example. So, 
And then there's another one that's distrust. And this is a really interesting one. So it, it may, I'm just curious why there would be distrust, but there's because that there's be a lot of conversation going on at a dinner table, for example, and that one deaf member of the family is wondering, are they talking about me? Is this a topic that is, and that's often a syndrome that we see at the dinner table where their family members and everyone, but the one person is deaf. Remembering we, we're saying that 97% of um, people who are deaf are born in hearing families. So the number is skewed massively against them. And so it's what they're missing out on at the dinner table. Sorry, Philip, I'm moving along. I'm, he's, oh, I can feel him looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> the other group uh, is the extrinsic stresses about how the perception is uh, of the people around me. So it might be at school, might be at the workplace. It could be family as well, brothers and sisters, where you get teased or you're bullied because you're deaf. Uh, you're oppressed, you're put down as a consequence of you not being um, fitting, you can't hear, you're not able to speak, for example, using your voice. And so as a result of that, we see the bullying and the condescension and the marginalisation. Uh, are you deaf? Whether it's malicious or whether it's done without purpose, these things, and that might be, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to not include you, but that's still a factor that contributes to this extrinsic stress. And they all equal these middle section here, which is the exhaustion and burnout and anger and anxiety, et cetera. Now, the, that's that one group. The other group who I did the survey, that was the interview group. The other group that I did the survey with, um, I was asked by Philip if I was able to provide some information to you that you might be able to uh, consider and then digest. And I haven't actually revealed all of this in a formal sense, but it's will give you a bit of a snapshot about some of the things that I've been considering over the, the last little while as part of my PhD studies. Okay, this is the next quiz too. So hopefully you enjoy this. During your adult years, this is a question that was asked of deaf and hard of hearing people over 18, have you experienced anxiety? How many, what percent do you think of this cohort of deaf and hard of hearing people over 18 have experienced anxiety? 75%? How many? 90? 90? 100? Yep. Okay, here we go. Let me reveal. So just under 80% of the responses said that they had experienced anxiety. This is 340 respondents of the questionnaire, the survey that I conducted, not the 16 people um, uh, from the interview. So they said, yes, I have experienced anxiety through my adult years from 18 years and onwards. The next question is relating to depression. So the same sort of question, but in relation to depression, it's 79%. Remember, this is uh, people over 18, have they experienced depression in their life? The third group or question that I asked is the suicide, um, que re the question regarding suicide, have they thought about taking their own life? And that's around half of that group. So if we, we try and visualise this, it would be half this room on one side have considered it and the other group have not. It's a sad number. So that's the information. Thank you for paying attention for that period of time. I hope that it's uh, provided you with some insights. Did you, how did he go? Was he, did you time, Ramos? Was he under five minutes? Four minutes, 59 seconds. That's <laughs> incredible. I can't believe it. You did it, Ramos. It's a sobering, they are sobering numbers, are they not? It's um, it's daunting to actually see statistics like that. It's uh, it's scary. So thank, thank you so much, Ramos. I really appreciate that. I look forward to um, seeing more of your published work over the next period of time. It's, it's, um, it's, 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 it's fantastic. I'm really grateful for you spending the time and hopefully there'll be um, some work that comes as a consequence of the work and the evidence that you've provided today. I've got some background here now just regarding uh, a deafness and hard of hearing as it relates to Australia. As uh, you see here, we, we, uh, it's estimated that 3.5 million Australians are living with a hearing loss. It's one in about six, and we suspect that number is going to uh, increase up to uh, one in four by 2050. 
we're talking about people with a hearing loss, whether they use sign language, uh, they have hard of hearing, they use hearing aids or other listening devices. So it's that whole number together. Um, we estimate to have 1.1 million people affected by hearing loss in Australia. This uh, provides a bit of a timeline of the deaf mental health and wellbeing in Victoria. You can see um, that uh, we had a deaf people with mental health conference in 2015. That's where it sort of started. That's just the seed was planted at that point in time. We had presentations, people talking about their lived experiences. Uh, there were some recommendations that were made as a consequence of that conference back then, nine years ago. Deaf Victoria steered that conference. Then we had the Royal Commission in Mental Health in 2019 and a number of recommendations were made as a result of that and some proposals put forward. A lot of the recommendations have been adopted by government in their final report, which is pleasing. The funding that we received, uh, we're grateful to receive, was enabled us from the Royal, uh, as a result, we were able to implement some of the things through the Royal Commission. And this particular project that we're doing here, uh, the design for the mental health for deaf Victorian, deaf and hard of hearing Victorians, uh, much like the minister said, after this um, project has been done, we'll then be able to deliver um, better mental health services to um, <coughs> deaf and hard of hearing communities um, beyond here. It's an exciting prospect. Rummus mentioned barriers that people experience as a deaf and hard of hearing person navigating life. Is a bit of a snapshot of the sum of the things as it applies to mental health services. I hope I'm doing justice here, Ramos. There's five key areas, I suppose you would say, um, that are displayed here. In the first instance, there are symptoms, deaf and hard of hearing people, perhaps they're not aware of their mental health and how they can articulate that, whether it's an addiction or mental health or, or other symptoms. They've never been ac had never had access to that information and then being able to understand what it means. And then moving on from there is that assessment stage. So a mental health professional might make an assessment of the deaf and hard of hearing person. Um, and because the information that they're getting from the deaf and hard of hearing person is not necessarily accessible to them and vice versa, it can complicate things. And of course, leading on directly from that, of course, is the misdiagnosis that commonly occurs from deaf mental health practitioners, oh, sorry, from mental health practitioners on deaf patients. Linking to that again, of course, would be treatment, whether that's um, errors in treatment or whether it's um, limited access resource and information that's provided to the person. And then of course, the recovery and care from that pathway. And it all of course would be skewed and often what we find is that it then just sort of repeats itself. We might get um, a support worker who's provided some support to a deaf person in a hospital and they won't say which hospital, but this is actually has happened where the, the deaf woman has given up on um, accessing mental health supports because in three occasions, separate occasions, they've tried to access a hospital in the emergency department and have been unsuccessful in getting through and getting a path a pathway to getting an interpreter and then having access to be able to properly articulate themselves in a language that they only know. And they were uh, in the hospital for uh, two weeks and were provided with an Auslan interpreter only once. And so you can only imagine the number of support people that came and visited that patient and yet uh, only one time they had an interpreter. So it makes it very difficult for everybody to know what's happening and how they can diagnose and provide the appropriate support and services and uh, treatments and medications, whatever it might be. I think this, uh, this slide shows it quite, quite clearly. And, and so what generally what happens is that the deaf person is then discharged back into the community and the thing repeats itself again, sadly. And um, so the trust in the whole system is lost. And I know that there's high care wards in hospitals as well, the high secure wards uh, where interpreters need to be able to access and a deaf person um, is really considered a low risk person <coughs> in these high risk places sometimes because the, um, the, the people who are supporting the deaf person don't understand the cultural and nuances and linguistic nuances that um, are misunderstood and considered that they're a high risk individual. Um, there's been, I think it was a couple of years ago as well, where a deaf person was in hospital for up to a week 
um, and was sedated in that space and were, the family weren't informed of their, um, their attendance at a hospital and the family were looking for them um, and they were <clears> waiting for an interpreter to try and come along and then they were able to then hopefully then communicate with the um, deaf person. But in the meantime, they had to sedate the patient until they were able to find an interpreter arrived. So that made it very difficult and it was sad. So the part of the work that we've done this year, uh, we've consulted with various groups and, uh, and partners. And this is a list of those uh, who we've consulted with, obviously deaf and hard of hearing community members who themselves were able to report and uh, disclose information and experiences that they've had. We've also worked with deaf and hard of hearing mental health professional people. Some of you are here today. I really appreciate you attending and, and watching this presentation. Uh, and we have the public Victorian Public Health Services, the Department of Health. And of course, we have Auslan interpreters in mental health services too, because their experience and their viewpoints is also considered. <coughs> we also conducted a survey um, what they uh, what their preferences were regarding accessing <coughs> services. So it gave us a, a really nice um, holistic and thorough wealth of information. Thank you. So the Royal Commission recommendation thirty four, uh, I think it was. I think there was all together there was 22, but they all linked to deaf, they all linked to deaf and hard of hearing. But the, the key one was this one, recommendation 34, which is essentially ensuring that the mental health system and the diverse components within that catered to the members of the deaf and hard of hearing community. We need to ensure that there's a cultural awareness, there's allowances for language, proper supports that are provided and implemented. And the design for the mental health service is done in a way that is complementary to the needs of the deaf and hard of hearing community. And the strategy to achieve that really does form part of the work that we've been doing. I also forgot to say, uh, if you've got time as well, we do have a Q&A at the end. So if you've got some questions, hold off until then and we'll be happy to spend some time responding. The Royal Commission's vision for the tiered Victorian mental health system is represented like this. I'm not sure if you can read that here, but at the very top, it's a family, families, carers and supports, uh, supporters, informal supports, uh, virtual communities, all the way down to here, the statewide services. So sort of like a tear down effect. The number of deaf people who use Auslan as their first language or people who have hard of hearing. So um, we're talking about people that are profoundly deaf. The number is not super clear, um, but at local level, lo at local level service locations, um, but a state for statewide services, the number obviously would be much bigger, but we don't have enough numbers to provide clear justifications, but we can say that the Victorian government does have a, a good statewide service um, capacity. I think there's 16 or 17 different types of uh, statewide services that exist. And here's a, a subset of what exists out there um, and the mental health services that provide services in the communities. And you can see here where the specialist mental health services uh, apply, then that's where we feel we would be able to then correlate with and deliver a deaf and hard of hearing mental health service. Other statewide services like um, neonatal services, dual disabilities or multiple disabilities and other services like that, we imagine that that's where the service, uh, that's this section or the area where we feel we would be able to collaborate best with in that, in that sort of space. So the vision for statewide model of care, it's essentially how we, we visualise it. It has good practice, it includes mental health services and ensures that all the services are accessible, including Auslan and other necessary supports, that they're safe spaces for deaf and hard of hearing people. And that there's an awareness and recognition of the cultural nuances that exist between deaf and uh, hard of hearing people, much like the, um, the, the trauma of the dinner table syndrome that Ramas referred to earlier. 
the language deprivation. I mean, that's sort of rare in Australia, the Western world where we do see that. But in Australia, there's not enough education or awareness or consideration about language deprivation. But it does exist in the deaf community and hard of hearing community in Australia. It's common for that to take place. And as a result of that, there's a lot of psychological um, impacts to the deaf community members because of that. And we're not sure how to diagnose that. So having more experience about that space and, and consider that when providing supports and services to um, the deaf and hard of hearing cohort. And it's, of course, it's important that families and community members are integrated in a way so that it's holistic. That's an important consideration too. Liaising with community in schools and other important uh, groups, workplaces, um, where it's not just the hospitals or the hospital settings rather, or the medical settings, but it's uh, much more widespread than that. That will have the biggest impact. So this looks a bit complicated, but bear with me. I'll give you a chance to just have a quick look and and then I'll refer <coughs> to it. I'll give you a, I'll give you a moment. You can see people, some people putting their glass on. That's good. That's evidence that you are actually paying attention and, and have a <coughs> What I wanted to refer to are the five sections here, the service components, I've called them, or we've called them. And I'll explain each of those five service components in a bit of detail just to um, to help with the understanding. Are we good? Can I continue? Just checking, right? Yep. All right, so those five service components, there are eight model of care design principles from those. Now I'm gonna share this model a little bit later and I'll distribute that and you can um, look at that more thoroughly, but here's a snapshot. Now those five separate service components that I referred to earlier in that complicated slide, this is how we imagine the service component or the community engagement. So they will deliver community-based mental health workshops to increase mental health literacy in an awareness regarding deaf and hard of hearing, the mental health scope, provide education workshops to community, develop mental health resources, community organisation levels. We'll work with other organisations, not just deaf and hard of hearing organisations, but work with other organisations so that uh, such as service providers, uh, the NDIS type organisations um, and support those entities to provide that support as well. The next one was uh, prevention of those five service components. So having the uh, the parent mental health and wellbeing amongst children and adolescents, of course, the early engagement with parents and providing support because, of course, a lot of parents, if they... Um, have a deaf child or a child with disability, then the there is a there is an impact or a shock at a, at a period of time where they are trying to understand how they're going to approach life, and there's some trauma associated with that as well. And um, it, it 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 remains and continues throughout for the parents and for the family and for the child impacted. So we want to be able to resolve that so that there's no space really for any grieving, but it's actually all educational and support, and that will be important for the service. A component of prevention to be implemented at this point so that it's uh, it's a smooth and it's an informative process there's a diagnosis that's taken place um and it's a matter of fact that and and, and also has a consideration of mental of mental health for infants which is prevalent in that space uh, so providing information and resources uh, and working with those early intervention spaces um, is important Okay, number five is the early intervention. So we're talking sort of three years and onwards up until around 18. There'll be a focus for that age group. The Department of Education will play a role. We have some people from the we'll go to mental health nurse and from one particular school that's here as well. I hope that we might be able to collaborate in some way into the future. Working, uh, working in schools and primary and secondary schools um, is, is an important part of the entire process. The Department of Education 
uh, we'll be working in the space in collaboration with Deaf Victoria and the and the proposal we're putting forward and hopefully provide a great support stream for students in that age group who are deaf and hard of hearing in the school settings and then provide referral services to the parents of those deaf children. Uh, there's a lot of psychological work that's done in that space and support for the children and families in the school setting. So we think if we're providing some really uh, holistic supports and informed supports in that age group, it make a big difference. The needs of deaf and hard of hearing children has changed over time. Um, when children are, are very young, um, the, well, I should say a lot of play-based activities from zero to say five or seven, it might have been in the past. And when they get a little bit older, they might then play with other children. And then language is the vehicle in which they engage with other people. And if they don't have uh, language, they only have Auslan or they have limited Auslan and they don't uh, aren't able to communicate with other members of their school settings, then it makes it very difficult for deaf and hard of hearing people to um, enjoy that experience. So, and of course, at that time in their, in the age groups, as they become teenagers, their bodies and their hormones are changing. And so having all of those periods um, catered for is necessary. Now, of course, we need supports for uh, all these um, uh, entities and the model that we're providing today or proposing um, is a sort of part of a second consultation. I'm not sure if you know what that means. I mean, I didn't actually know what that meant before I started, but a conduct a secondary consultation service will be necessary. My mental, um, sorry, my experience isn't in the mental health space. So I've actually learned quite a lot through this journey as well, but a secondary consultation service um, is essentially where a person might appear, a deaf person might appear at a hospital, for example, and there will be some, uh, but at an emergency department where they do an assessment and they organise for services to be applied. Um, by engaging with all those points of contacts, we feel that um, we are able to provide a secondary consultation service to those points of contact so that the assessment's done correctly and all of those other points of contact, diagnosis, etc., cetera, are, are correct and accurate. There needs to, obviously, there needs to be a very good relationship with that consultation and the hospital, for example, in this case. Uh, I did actually forget or forgot to say earlier that through the research that we've been conducting with Deakin University and others and KPMG, we've had a partnership, a great partnership with them. We've developed the model, so I will acknowledge them a little bit later on. But uh, there's a various services and overseas companies too and allied services that have all played a role in this. There's... A question regarding deaf health, mental health services. Um, uh, there's one in Brisbane that I'm referring to, and they provide a lot of feedback and um, provided some case studies and experiences about their work. And one of the things that really they strongly recommended was this relationship. So that service, say, the recommendation is that the hospitals need to have a strong um, relationship because they often think that the all the services are provided under the one location of the one hospital, but that's not necessarily the case. So it's um, it's all of the players that we're focusing on. So of course we 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 haven't started from scratch, but there's some work, international work that's been done for mental health services in the UK and and abroad in other locations, and they've recommended that. Um, we provide, we haven't really provided any linkage service at the start. We, what we're going to need to do is provide uh, so, so things such as the secondary consultation services and other clear pathways for people in order for them to be able to navigate the, the, the supports and being able to articulate and then display that and ensure that it's communicated in a way so everyone can expect and foresee what the pathway will be for them when they make those points of contact. Um, that's necessary and that's a recommendation that has been strong from a lot of the people that we've been communicating with. And, of course, delivering and educating <laughs> training workshops for all of these locations. Um, I'm using hospital as an example, but there's obviously so many people. So where deaf people contact organisations or services, they're the services that we need to deliver these types of education and training workshops to ensure that they're well-equipped, they're aware, they're sensitive, they're, um, they're confident in dealing with people who are deaf and hard of hearing because they're familiar with the nuances of, of the community group.
Now, a lot of these, a lot of these services don't provide directly provide medical uh, diagnoses or medications, but it's um, perhaps in the future there will be a, 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 a clinic or a service that's provided. It might be like a one-stop shop if there's a demand for that and there's evidence that suggests that that should be the case. Um, but in time, that may happen. But um, in Victoria, we originally that there would be a mental health service or a clinical service that's set up. Um, I feel that would be a, a, a dream, but I think we're just we'll, we'll just slowly chip away, and hopefully we'll realise um, that utopian consideration at some point. So um, we've we've mentioned um, a couple of things regarding the consult the consultation uh, services that are provided. There. The consultation that services provide, we, just, we feel that this, there has been a, a gap in the counselling um, that's taken place. The, in the, sorry, I'm getting support on the other side here. Uh, there, there, are, there are no gaps in some of the uh, the counselling services that exist, but if for the deaf and hard of hearing people, there, there can be. So, there, so what happens is deaf and hard of hearing people are then referred to counselling services um, and they'll then be included with other deaf friendly counselling services that hopefully will be implemented as a result of all of this because of their awareness of the services that will eventually be implemented. So we don't really want the government to invest in services that we already have. We want them to invent, uh, sorry, invest in services that where we've identified gaps that exist. Now, understanding the funding model uh, associated with this, there's going to be a team of psychologists and counsellors and mental health nurses, a team of other people with expert services and knowledge, and there's an expense associated with that, of course. And I think now that we realise and we understand that, I think that over time that could be something that we'll eventually get to, and that would be the goal. The other final service component is the research and evaluation. And I, and I applaud the work that Ramos has been done because his PhD work and findings um, is, is, is incredible and it's providing us with a lot of information for the, the entire mainstream community to consider and it shows an interesting deaf perspective on what is necessary for the mainstream community and allied services, et cetera, to, to consider. And currently the information is, is few and far so hopefully we're able to develop a, a great tool or a, we'll be able to validate the information so that when psychologists or counsellors and mental, mental health uh, professionals are supporting deaf and hard of hearing people that it's being done because it's evidence-based and it's been validated from the work that's been done, much like the work that Rummis is providing. And there's some deaf and hard of hearing people who have dementia and um, for, people who have, for people who have dementia, there is... Um, they, they may use different signs. Uh, they, there's ways that they may articulate themselves using language that is different. Of course, 98 out of 100 people, um, you're, we, we should be able to properly diagnose people because we're going to have the supports behind us to be able to make proper um, assessments on, on individuals. Now, of course, I'm not a clinical uh, expert by any stretch, but for example, Cognitive behaviour therapists or the CBT experts that are out there, that's based a lot on English uh, research and spoken language and the questions that they ask are much targeted to the responses that hearing people <laughs> are responding to. So that's the auditory responses and how they may um, articulate using spoken language uh, or people who have schizophrenia, um, those reports or those assessments are based on how people articulate or speak and respond to questions that are provided them by the, the clinic, the clinicians. And for deaf and hard of hearing people, those reports with the focus on spoken language aren't properly, um, aren't, aren't properly designed for people who are deaf that use sign language to communicate and then they are not able to diagnose properly. So a, a much more thorough uh, framework and policy from the research findings should make a difference in that space. And of course, the outcomes as well, conducting deaf led evaluations uh, linked with um, so the project that I think Amy's working on as well, developing some outcomes just in the general space, but also for deaf and hard of hearing people 
that we can sort of link that to a lot of the existing supports that are out there and then the specific research that we find that cater to deaf and hard of hearing the individuals can then be implemented into the services that are provided so that they're targeted to deaf and hard of hearing people and the language that they use and all the nuances and then we'll able to then build on data from the work that we um, we gather from those assessments and reviews and of course conducting deaf led evaluation of the implementation of the model of care with ongoing assessment review analysis and evaluation developing best practices and frameworks <laughs> and use this evidence which we understand is necessary So those five key areas that are or the five components, they nicely lead to this next steps slide is what things that we consider we need to do. So now that we've identified the services, we have to consider what we need to do to implement. We need a space or a location. We need to have some staff. We need to have, whether it's going to be a hospital location or a mental health or allied health location. Uh, the size of the workforce, what does that mean? We've got a bit of an understanding about that, but we're going to need to work with a number of people, the Department of Health, for example, mental health service providers and others. We'll obviously need to also embark on a regular monitoring and evaluation of the process and what's working, what isn't. We can make necessary adjustments along the way considering technology and the infrastructures that's required to make this happen, how big, how many desks, how many computers, logistics, infrastructure. So hopefully it's from the information that I've provided to you today, it's given you a nice overall snapshot of what exists and what's happening, what the gaps are and uh, where we can work together to deliver a service outcome for deaf and hard of hearing people for a successful health outcome. Thank you for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. So this is my opportunity here to say thank you to the people in the steering committee that have been uh, part of this um, work. It's been uh, from February, it's almost a year, so February next year, but we've been working terribly hard. Um, people have been very flexible and they've committed tirelessly to the work. Um, KPMG have uh, helped and Deakin University have also played a big role in us being able to deliver this. And so to, to you, I really appreciate um, being part of this, this overall group and uh, project. I'd also like to say thank you to Kim, who has provided the design of this um, slideshow that everyone's been looking at. I really appreciate the dedication that you've provided, Kim, and you've really challenged yourself and pushed you through. You've learned a lot of new skills along the way, I believe, as well. So congratulations and thank you to you and also to the Diversity Community Department of Health and Mental Health group who have uh, provided uh, funding and support to Deaf Victoria also. Of course, without that, it wouldn't have happened. And uh, of course, to all of you that are here, members of the Deaf community who have supported me and Deaf Victoria and have trusted um, and relied on us that we can deliver uh, using our experiences for an overall better future for everybody. So thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, how have I gone? I've gone quite well with time, actually. I've just looked at the clock. How'd I go? Four minutes left. Wow, that's incredible. Okay, so if there's any questions, we've got a short amount of time. Um, we do have a microphone, so if you're hearing, I'll pass the microphone over to you. If not, you can sign your question and we'll interpret that. Thank you. Has anyone got any questions? An easy question, please. Bum, Philip. I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens and transpires from all of this. There's one comment you made, Philip, regarding uh, that counselling part, it's not necessarily relating to that, but the second, not investing in counselling, whether there's enough or whether they're very busy because the demand for that service is incredible. And deaf and hard of hearing people, uh, even more so, it's compounded by the fact that they're waiting for people to provide that. There's an issue there. I'm just wondering whether you could comment on that. <laughs> I thought I told you to ask an easy question, Ramos. Okay, so yes, I'm, I'm aware of the waiting list that exists. Uh, the government departments 
um, don't have enough evidence on that. And there's a lot of referrals and referral lists that we can probably use and provide and inform uh, and the statewide services that are out there. And we say, well, we know that there's a waiting list for counselling and the demand for that in the mental health space is considerable and it's regrettable. At Deaf Victoria, we've got, I think, two or three years, we've seen somewhere around 23 deaf friendly mental health services that exist. They're available either online or Deaf Victoria or face-to-face -face, uh, that we've promoted. Um, and there's a waiting list for those. Some of them are new, some of them have been around for a little while. So there's a bit of um, a variety in there, but yes, Ramos, sadly, it's hard to answer the question within in a black and white way because that is not possible. And there are no deaf people who are, uh, who are providing those supports. There's a, there's a, there's a, and if there was, it would be, um, too few in order to be able to meet the demand that's coming. So it's a decision that, um, it's a clinical decision. No, it's a, a decision that's difficult to make sadly. And, um, and respond in a way that's going to appease anybody. Any other questions? So just for information, the work that I've done as an interpreter in the clinic, uh, I'm a coder, a child of a deaf adult, so my parents are deaf. I'm a hearing person with deaf parents. That makes sense. So I grew up in a deaf family and as a person who is hearing, I had to navigate a couple of cultures that was really interesting and it did impact on my mental health and I felt that, that that's a unique point of difference and environmental factor for me as a hearing person in a deaf family and family services and I felt that would an area that would have been a really great focus for the deaf community too who might have hearing children is that um, for coders, child of deaf adults themselves and the life experiences that they have um, and uh, that would be an interesting point of, point of uh, focus and I'm wondering whether the research is focused and, and has any information on that cohort, children of <laughs> uh, Once again, I did say easy questions. Um, thanks. Gabriel, I think linked with family services, let me go this one. This is the service component prevention, um, mental health and wellbeing for families. I think that probably touches on that in a way. Uh, I know that there's a lot of children who have, uh, we will be including children who are coders, children who are hearing that have deaf parents as part of our research, but um, what or what specific groups in the community are impacted and how and what that means will be further explored. But at the moment, what we're trying is not to design or be too prescriptive in the information, but rather uh, keep it fairly broad and so that it's a bit easier for uh, those support services to be able to deliver sort of a generic type support to the deaf and hard of hearing communities um, and to family supports. And then hopefully within those supports that are, that are, that are, that, are, that are happening, then they can then explore more deeply into the, the nuances or the uniqueness of each family situation. And that includes the, the family members of deaf parents as well. Yes. This will be an easy question for you, Philip. Congratulations, by the way, to Deaf Victoria. It's a project that is, it's incredible. I think that uh, we can't disagree with the evidence-based information that's delivered here. I've got a question uh, regarding next. So the government provides funding to Deaf Victoria to design a model and then, or what we, the deaf community or the deaf sector can do to support you to make this a reality into the future. What are some of the things that we could do? Yeah, I think I think I can answer that one. That's good. Thank you. Well, what we plan to do is well, after today, we'll release this proposal, this support. We've done a lot of uh, work in the background. Now that we're delivering and making this public, we'll be networking with all the key service providers, community organisations in Victoria, um, and deaf and hard of hearing organisations for support. We'll be seeking support and and um, and help from those groups including uh, minister and the minister for of and in, in the community sector as well so that they're able to provide support so uh, we will be asking for support we're proactively taking a step um, to now that we feel that there's the need we're able to validate it we support it with lots of evidence um, that we'll then be reaching out to all the necessary groups much like you mentioned Brent so that we can get that proper support 
um, including the Department of Health, of course, who have a real interest in supporting us as well. And we've got lots of networks and important relationships with um, partners. So we'll be taking a proactive approach in that space. Yes. Speaking, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, just wanted to ask around, um, because the focus, is, especially in Victoria, after the um, Royal Commission has been around both um, mental health consumers, but also carers. I wonder if um, it's already been considered like how deaf carers and supporters of people with um, mental health, whether that's other deaf people or hearing people, how that fits into the deaf service model, given that kind of mental health services more broadly are moving towards also providing supports for carers of people with mental health. I'm not sure if you actually knew we had a project last year for uh, with and a relationship with Carers Victoria, but yes, uh, a little bit like what the question that you were asking, uh, Gabriel, um, regarding coders, different groups that exist within sort of subgroups within the um, the overarching deaf and hard of hearing mental health. Now that that falls within that, and yes, absolutely, that they would form part of the uh, the approach. When we do eventually set up a service that um, we're recruiting staff and that that utopian concept, we'll have a, a group of priority or a list of priorities that we'll be focused on, and that of course would be one of those. We believe that Department of Health obviously should be setting up this service, not Deaf Victoria. That's not uh, our remit, of course, but we would advocate and make uh, net, make or make available all the necessary information that would then equip the Department of Health to be able to deliver on what we've provided. So. Um, yeah, I know that it, it's a little bit like it. Here you go, take take it and run. But the design is there, and uh, th there'll be some some modifications to what we provide. I suspect, but it'd be very exciting to see how it, it does actually transpire. But yeah, I do agree with you. Your care is a very important. Any other questions? One more, anyone? Maybe. I thought you had your hand up. No, okay. Is this waiting? No. Just going once, going twice. Done. Yeah. Okay. So again, thank you to everyone who's here. You've um, committed and made your time available to be here. And I really look forward to working with you all into the future. Thanks for paying attention and, and for your customer. Thank you. And you still got the opportunity to steal tea and coffee before you 